you're using it in various aspects of, of the, the business in terms of how you think about managing money. Well, where do you think this is going? You know, certainly we can do little things here and there. Uh, do you think we'll get to a point where, where you know, we can actually tell it to structure a portfolio? Do you think we can tell it to, you know, it's time to, to buy the long bond or sell, you know, or sell uh, Apple stock or, you know, where do you think this goes? Let's talk about what you can already use it for, because I think we can kind of dream it's going to be useful for a lot of things. But I became aware of, of the real power of uh, AI maybe a, a little over five years ago um, when I realized that so much of the street was using AI and programs to uh, make markets. Um, the big areas uh, that we, I think we all know, the ETF has, uh, universe has been mushrooming. And the amount of trading associated with ETFs is just unbelievable. Um, and what you realize is that the market makers um, in the securities that kind of um, support these ETFs, um, it's almost all algorithmic. It's almost all using AI. They're using price feeds to um, implement like bids and offers based on certain parameters. And I just remember myself trying to buy an asset um, we didn't see it, particularly in fixed income. You don't see assets trade all the time. There's some of these dark pool and liquidity providers, um, and we'll occasionally see uh, a flash will go up that something's on the board. And if I'm interested, let's say, to pick up $2 million of a certain name, I remember one specific day where 500000 was being offered, and my trader came to me and said, hey, I have an offer of 500000 Do you want to buy it? And I said, how much did we want to buy? He said, $2 million. And he said, I said, ah, okay, go ahead. By the time he went, it was gone. It had been taken already. And that's because so many of the market makers have uh, algorithms and AI essentially uh, bidding and, uh, for assets and selling assets at certain prices. So what we realize it's already on the execution side. We have to compete with these um, players in terms of finding assets that we might want. So that was sort of like alerted us. But recently with the chat GPT phenomenon, I think it's important where you're gonna immediately see this being rolled out, which is um, consolidating research. And so I think like many people in this room since COVID, I get invited to like 20 webinars a day. I cannot physically make 20, I can't even do you know, a quarter of them. But what you can now do is record them. You can actually have uh, it being transcribed and then you could have it all summarized by a variety of AI products. And so what that absolutely allows you to do is synthesize enormous amounts of data that you just could not humanly do uh, before. Now then the question is, can we bolt all of this uh, purported wisdom? And of course, what we learn from these webinars is, it's like a 90 minute webinar gets boiled down to about a minute 45 worth of, of actual content. usable yeah. content. So it saves a lot of time, but eventually you'll be able to maybe uh, analyze this this webinar data that you're getting an opinion with um, market movement and seeing if there is actually some correlation or any of it could be useful to you know make some predictive investments. Um, but you're already sort of seeing little bits of it already processing information, saving you time, and also executing much faster than a human could execute. Interesting. When you start looking at large large language models, what does that mean, kind of in relationship to the things that Peter was talking about more on the, you know, where the trading models where where it's just trying to you know figure out what's the quote of IBM at this you know given second, you know, or is that is that a different kind of a, you know I, I think it's a different kind of AI you know it, it actually is and and thank you for that question because I was going to kind of uh, throw in my own question to the to the panel, um, but I want I wanted to go back to the webinar question because I think it's it's actually pretty important. We spend a lot of time focusing on this. We look at the strategic level of these types of tools. And so we look at efficiency versus effectiveness. You know, efficiency is, are we doing things right? And effectiveness is, are we doing the right things? And there's a big difference between the two. So in your your comment where you're talking about all the webinars and how you can't go through all the webinars, right? Efficiency, using the technology to be more efficient is being able to take these you know, two hour webinars and 
knocking them down to 90 seconds worth or writing them out or transcribing. But the more strategic side of it is getting the technology to say, which ones do I have to really listen to? Yeah, well, that, that absolutely is um, the case. And what's interesting is uh, for the time being, like you still want to have, um, I think you, Jake, you called it a co-pilot, right? So you want to have your sort of AI tool. You're going to want to have somebody there to say, um, actually looking through this, this was important in this webinar. Most of this webinar was not that important. This one was important. And then be able to somehow um, build that into your uh, LLMs, right? Trying to be able to have some kind of filtering, human filtering, which will um, help you even further. So yes, now you've got these tw 20 webinars that have been boiled down to a couple of minutes each, but then the real question is, are any of them any good? Who, where, where, where really is the, is the value? Um, and then also sometimes you might wanna then take the time to sort of go back to the source and actually say like, is it completely explaining it the way, you know, uh, uh, is the AI explaining it the way uh, I would maybe understand it? Um, so this process, I would imagine, it's going to take years to kind of keep ping-ponging back between is it effective, is it getting better? Um, I'm assuming that the technologies really are there, uh, have the ability to kind of improve, but they really do need human intervention for the improvements. I, I agree completely. And to get back to your, your question, Larry, about large language models, it all depends on what's in your large, what's your data set? Because... Um, Data sets are different. And how do you know, as a, as a PM, how do you know what data set is being used to come to the decision on which of these things to listen to or which security to get into or which security to get out of or whatever? Um, you know, there's, those are big issues. Is the large language model, is it all free data? Is it copyrighted data? Uh, there's an ethics level. Is some of it... Um, Non-public information, that's a good one. That'll keep all your compliance people happy for a long time. Um, you know, so there are all kinds of different nuances there. And, uh, you know, I forget the beginning of your question, but I'll, I'll stick with him, is that I don't think you're ever going to replace the human. You're going to use these technologies to support the human decisions. And Jake, uh, Barry brings up a really interesting point um, around IP. Um, and given, you know, you're, you're an exchange uh, and, and part of TR, um, own a lot of IP, uh, Alice, and, you know, you've got a lot of technology that's looking at it. How do you, how do you start thinking about managing that? You know, uh, clearly I, I would assume that, that if I run a model that uses, you know, refinitive data, uh, you know, you'd like to get compensated for that. Allison... Um, you, you want to try to democratize this as much as you can. I, I assume, you know, that becomes an issue. If I can't get access to refinitive data, then how, how does my model work? I, well, I don't know. I, I don't think Alice and I are necessarily in total conflict. I mean, you, you also sell compute, and there's ways, technological ways, to kind of protect our IP. This, this question comes up all the time. Clients don't want to... You know, they, they don't want to share their special sauce. They don't want to share their positions. They don't want to share their analyses. Yet they want a lot of services around them. They want efficiency. They want debugging that's very fast. And it comes back to, well, tell us what you ran and how you ran it. So we use a lot of on-site, off-site. We use a lot of um, client deployments. And we, we lean on technology to kind of protect IP. Um, there's some give and take. As these large language models proliferate, the more data you feed it, the more precise it's going to get. If clients want that kind of precision, they're going to have to, in some capacity, share their data. Yeah, I, the Federal Reserve is concerned about this. It's one of the um, issues which come, come up when we talk about using uh, language models. We have a communications and outreach group that is very um, determined to use them because it takes them a lot of time to translate something from our economist's blog. We have something called the Liberty Street blog, where we have these detailed economic papers. And they would like to change it to something that looks like a weather forecast on our website about the economy. And we did this. And we had to convince people that we weren't taking IP from anyone. But because the blog originated at the Fed, and the only concern was when it was translating it to simpler language, would it borrow from something else? And we looked over it and we were convinced that it was okay.
But in general, it's a problem. If you wanted to publish something and you wanted to ask a question and have it create an answer, where did that answer come from? Sometimes the ideas can be traced back to sources. So this is why they're interested in more of the, uh, you know, the RAG paradigm, the retrieval augmented generation, where you can see where the ideas are coming from. And in that case, you may, for IP, have some kind of, you know, payment or compensation system put in place. We were sort of joking about this the other day and said, well, maybe Amazon should have a service where you could put any book you have on your Kindle into their rag for questions and answers. But uh, somehow this will have to be worked out.